The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Let's talk about what Mendel really did in his experiments. So, section one. Mendel's experiments. Mendel did a lot of really cool things. The first thing he did was, in order to study heredity, that was his assignment as a monk, go study heredity, he had to get some material to work with. He decided to use peas. Why peas? Well, there are a lot of varieties of, pea, of peas in the market, many different kinds of peas, and you could breed them together. There were tall peas, short peas, green peas, yellow peas, round peas, wrinkled peas, all kinds of peas that you could find in the market. They grew very well in the garden. And when you were done with the experiment, you could feed them to the monks. So the first thing he did was he got his material. And did he immediately start crossing his peas together? No. What did he do? <coughs> Sorry? He first grew them separately because he wanted to see if he was going to study how traits were inherited, he first had to do the control experiment. He first had to show that if he took each variety of peas, they would breed true. So the first thing is Mendel did controls. That's an important thing we learned from Mendel. He took round peas, he took wrinkled peas, and he bred them with themselves and they always came out round and he took wrinkled peas and he bred them with himself and they came out wrinkled. And if they hadn't always come out round or hadn't always come out wrinkled, it would have been a much harder experiment to interpret later. So that was an incredibly important thing to do, was do the controls, round and wrinkled. Then, when he was satisfied that he had pure breeding or true breeding plants, then, and only then, did he do an experiment. What experiment did he do? You all know Mendel. I mean, the truth is, this is not like a surprise here, right? So what did he do? He crossed the round and the wrinkled. I'm trying to draw out the new things here, but some of the old ones you know. And when he crossed round and wrinkled, we'll call this the F0 generation. In the F1 generation, what did he see? Round, right? You all know this. He saw all round. He didn't see puckered, slightly puckered, or anything like that. He didn't see any wrinkles. They were all every bit as round as the rounds in the, in the parental generation. That was an extremely important point because, of course, a competing theory of inheritance was blending inheritance, where the offspring would be intermediate. And the truth is, almost every experiment that you do when you take plants and you cross them, or animals and you cross them, despite your biology textbook, shows blending inheritance. A tall plant and a short plant, you breed them, almost always as a mid middle plant. But not for the peas. The peas were a beautiful system. And Mendel was very lucky to have chosen them because the truth is there was only one gene difference that was controlling these traits. If there had been 10 genes controlling this, you'd get some blending, blah, blah, blah. But Mendel got a situation with really clean experimental data. The round was every bit as round. And so that said, no blending. Now what did he do? Next, what Mendel does is he crosses these round peas to themselves. He selfs them. So we're going to self the peas. The peas can be selfed. They have both male and female reproductive parts. And when he selfs them, they self-pollinate. And what do they produce? Peas, right? <laughs> That's good. And they produce peas. And what does he notice? He notices that now they're not all round. Some of them are wrinkled. And the wrinkles are every bit as wrinkled as the wrinkles were in the parental generation F0. 
and the rounds are every bit as round. So suddenly, wrinkled had gone away, and what had happened? Sorry, wrinkled had gone away in, the, in this generation, and now it had reappeared. The trait reappears. It's quantal. It's discrete. It's not blended out in any way. It's not blended. It's not imperfect. It's the same wrinkle that was there before. That's a big qualitative observation. This whole blending notion can't be right, at least for this experiment. Discreteness rules. So that was his experiment. Mendel could have written it up and said, wow, the traits don't blend. They're discrete. But Mendel, being an MIT kind of monk, went further. What did he do? Sorry? He repeated it, and it still showed some rounds and wrinkles and all that. But he was a very quantitative MIT monk. He counted them, which, is, which seems obvious, but ain't so obvious. He counted them. And what did he find? Fix, what, what, fixed proportions? What? A ratio. A ratio. Isn't it one to three? One to three, or three to one, or something like that? No. No. <laughs> no. No, he counted. He counted, and what he found was rounds, 5,474, wrinkles, 1,850. Ratio, not 3 to 1 at all, 2.96 to 1. No, 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 but you see, you say because your book's all to you three to one, that it's obvious if you do that, you say that must be three to one. If that must be three to one, it's 2.96 to one. And if you do it again, you might get 2.87 to one. And it actually takes quite an imagination to say it's trying to be three. Just think about it, you know. You come to this experiment, and you say it's trying to be three. That's a separate leap and an important leap. He counted, and he got numbers. 2.96 to 1, and he got other numbers. <laughs> he then, as you've done so quickly, made a hypothesis. That hypothesis was that, in fact, this was trying to be 3 to 1, that it, quote, wanted to be 3 to 1. It was near 3 to 1. And that, really, the reason it was trying to be 3 to 1 was because well, there was a pretty nice explanation here. His cool explanation was the round plants and the wrinkled plants, well, he made up a model. These guys had two particles of inheritance, big R, big R, little r, little r. When you cross them together, these guys were big R, little r. And when you self them, if you randomly chose one particle from the sperm and one particle from the egg, ovule, you would have big R, big R, big R, little r, little r, big r, and little r, little r, all as possibilities. And that these guys, big R, big R, they would be round. Why would they be round? Well, because that's what the parental generation here was. The little r, little r, they would be wrinkled because that's the parental generation there. And these guys that have one of each, what would they be? Round because we saw that in the F1 generation, one of each makes it round. So we had a model, a hypothesis, a model. Pretty cool. You can come up with this model by saying the contribution from the male, the contribution from the female, 
This is the male gametes, the female gametes. You get this nice little thing sometimes referred to as a Punnett square, although he didn't use Punnett squares, and Punnett wasn't born yet. Um, now what do you do? Mendel went out and got an experimental material. He did controls. He did an experiment. He counted. He then made this creative leap to say, I see something kind of cool going on. I think integers are what's going on. And made up a model. What does a scientist do at that point? Sorry? Oh, come on. In this modern world, if you got a result this cool, what would you be doing? Sorry? Publish it, right? You're going to get out there quickly and publish it. Mandel whips off an email to Nature in London saying, saying, I mean, or the, whatever the 1865 email is. Actually, it wasn't Nature. It, it, nature. it gets published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Bruneau. But forgive me, I'll use Nature, okay? So he whips off an email to Nature, which is what we do today, telling the editor, we have this really cool result. I think it'll be of broad interest to the, to the readers of Nature. Um, we're going to try to send you a paper next week, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are you interested? They write back, oh, yeah, we'd love to see your paper, Gregor. And uh, Mendel whips together a paper. What happens when Mendel whips together this paper and it goes off to London, to Nature, the offices of Nature? What does Nature do with it? They just set it in type and say, here it is. What's the scientific process? Peer review, right? Before you go print this thing, you've got to send it out to some other scientists, anonymous, you know, as anonymous reviewers, and say, we've received this paper, this correspondence from uh, you know, uh, uh, Brother Mendel. Um, in, in, uh, in Moravia, um, would you review it for the journal Nature and tell us your candid opinion? And they write it up and they send it back to Nature and Nature makes a decision whether to publish the paper. So you're the reviewers. Should we publish Mendel's paper? Who says yes? Who says no? Why no? Needs more examples. So you're right, one lousy trait. Mendel actually had seven traits in the paper, it turns out. I didn't tell you them all. Green and yellow and tall and short, and they're all in the paper. He actually has seven separate examples that show the same thing. Should we publish it? Why not? It's just peas? Oh, boy, you're churlish there. I mean, <laughs> come on. It's peas. It's, you know, people eat a lot of peas. It's a result. It'll, it'll get others in the scientific community interested. Who are the peer reviewers? You. I've assigned you as peer reviewers. I'm asking you, should we publish this thing? We've got seven traits. We're going to publish it. It's pretty cool. Nobody's ever reported this three to one ratio on this model. That's true, but I wasn't a peer reviewer back then. Well, you are now. Then yes, I would publish it. You'd publish it. Okay, he'd publish it. Because nobody's reported this. It's pretty cool. The model perfectly fits the data. Yes? got to make predictions. But the model fits the data. Are you saying that we made up the model after we saw the data? And that it's not a surprise that the model fits the data? <laughs> yeah, that's right, isn't it? That's a real problem. If you make up models after they fit the data, they tend to fit the data. <laughs> well, they do. That's a real problem. So the reviewers write back to Mendel and say, Mendel, this isn't actually how it happened, you understand. But anyway, they, they write back to Mendel, they write back to the journal Nature, and they anonymously say, we would like to see some predictions of this model to see if this is really true. And Nature writes back to Mendel, and the email says, could you show us some predictions from this? So help Mendel out. What predictions can we make? What surprising predictions could you make for Mendel's experiment? Well, this experiment, round by wrinkled, gives round, gives some rounds and some wrinkles, which we think are big R, big R, big R, little R, little R, big R, little R, little R, and that this is big R, big R. How could we prove something's going on in this generation? Self them. If we pick out a round and self it, what's going to happen? 
Sorry? Depends. So how do I know which round to pick? They all look the same. Try all of them. If I try all of them, what am I going to see? Produce round. About what fraction of them will only produce round? One third. And what fraction will produce rounds and wrinkles? Two thirds. We have a prediction. Thank you. The prediction is test the rounds and although we don't know which are which, one third of them will give rise to only rounds, whereas two thirds of them will give round, rise to our three to one ratio. That is a non-obvious prediction. If this model weren't right, it's very surprising that you would have nailed that prediction. Nice. What other predictions can you make? What other crosses could you set up to test it? The wrinkles by themselves will only give wrinkles, and that's true. Bingo, so we're doing well. What else? Wrinkles with rounds. So I could take these three rounds here, and I could cross them to wrinkles. What will happen here? If this was round, round, over wrinkled, wrinkled, it's going to give rise to what? All rounds. But if this is round, wrinkled, what will it give rise to? 50-50. Half a half. Now we're cooking. There are all these predictions that start dropping out because your model tells you things you haven't yet seen. Mendel writes back and says, I did all, your, I did all the, the experiments that uh, I did what the referees requested. The referees get the paper back. They say, yes, indeed, Mendel's done the experiments. We recommend publication. Nature publishes it. Uh, they you know, put out a press release and all that. Mendel's on the evening news, that kind of thing. Um, it didn't really happen that way exactly. But anyway, you get the point. That's the process of doing science. It's a cool process, and it's a back and forth. And it's a process of convincing people, and you convince them by predictions. And you can think of the kinds of cool predictions you could make. And that's what's fun about working in a lab, is making those kind of predictions. Now, all right. I need to give you a few definitions. A gene. When I refer to a gene for the moment, I mean a discrete factor of inheritance. Discrete particle factor of inheritance, something like that. Because geneticists early on had no idea what genes were. You know perfectly well a gene is a DNA sequence, blah, 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 blah. But, but it's useful to be able to think about a gene in the abstract. It's the thing that controls a particular inheritance of a particular trait. Variant forms of a gene, alternative forms of a gene, are called alleles. When I write big R, little r, they are alleles of the gene for roundness. Allele from the Greek meaning other or alternative. When I write genotype, I mean the combination of alleles. that an individual has. Like when I write big R, big R, that's a genotype. Or little uh, big R, little r. Or little r, little r, that's a genotype. When I say the word phenotype, what do I mean? A trait, an appearance. What are the traits under discussion here? Round and wrinkled. Okay, Geneticists are like mathematicians. They're very precise about their words. Now comes the ones that people always have trouble with. Dominant and recessive. Phenotype 1 is dominant 
to phenotype 2, if the, oops, sorry, I meant to add two words here, heterozygote, homozygote, words you know as well, heterozygote, having different alleles, homozygote, having the same alleles, different same alleles. So a phenotype, phenotype 1 is dominant to phenotype 2, if the F1 heterozygote, the cross between them, has phenotype 1. Why did I write this in this wacky mathematical way? That says round is dominant to wrinkled if when I cross round to wrinkled, the offspring are round. So which is dominant, round or wrinkled? Which is dominant, big R or little r? No. Big R is an allele. We said phenotypes are dominant, not alleles. We don't say big R is dominant to little r. We say round is dominant to wrinkled. Now this will bother you greatly, and it will bother about 95% of my biology colleagues. But geneticists who are careful use the word dominant and recessive to refer to phenotypes, not alleles. Why do I care? I care because big R, as a molecular allele, as a variant of a gene, might end up controlling three or five different traits. Some of the traits that big R controls could be dominant. Some of them could be recessive. Sickle cell anemia, there's a sickle cell mutation. Is that, is that recessive or dominant? Sickle cell anemia is a recessive trait, a recessive phenotype. But sickle cell trait, the tendency for blood cells to sickle at low oxygen tension, is a dominant phenotype. The allele that causes sickle cell anemia causes a recessive trait, anemia, and a dominant trait that can be measured in heterozygotes. You will forget this, everyone will forget this, but I've at least told you once that alleles could control multiple phenotypes and do control multiple phenotypes, and that's why geneticists obsess about using the words recessive and dominant to refer to the phenotype, not the genotype. I've made my plea, you all, like, like all of my colleagues in the biology department, you will continue to misuse the word, but there's a better chance you'll get it right because I've made my little stand here. Okay, recessive is the opposite of this, right? Good. This is mostly to say geneticists try to think carefully about their words. Those are the definitions. You should be able to use the words gene, allele, genotype, heterozygote, homozygote, phenotype, dominant, recessive in a good way.